Avi, the question of life outside of Earth has been a perennial one in the human condition. It's a natural question that we ask, and we all ask it as children and as we're growing up and thinking about the world. Uh, what you've done, though, is you've elevated this question radically in modern science. Uh, what's the motivation for that, and what, what are some of the scientific background that enables you to do that? Well, many of my colleagues uh, focus on searching for life in our vicinity, but I try to ask a more basic question. Um, when did life start in the universe? How early could it have started? And when will it end? And is it really most likely for us to exist next to a star like the sun today? Yeah. As it turns out, uh, the most abundant stars are about a tenth of the mass of the sun, and they last for a thousand times longer. Uh, up to 10 times. trillion years. Wow, because our sun is, uh, what, 10, 10, 10 billion, billion years. years. Yes. And wow. Um, wow. an interesting question is whether we are more likely to live next to a low-mass star in the distant future than we are next to the sun today. And so, first of all, I was wondering when did life start in the early universe? The very first stars formed around the 30 million years after the Big Bang. That's very, very early. It's early, but if you go a little bit farther back, 15 million years after the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe at large was room temperature. Wow. And so in principle, wow. if there was a planet back then, then uh, it could have retained liquid water on its surface without being close to a star. Uh -huh. However, the very first stars, according to the current standard model of cosmology, formed a bit later. And shortly after they formed, uh, the very first planets should have formed. And then uh, billions of years pass by, and here we are next to the sun. <laughs> and In a very cold universe. Uh, the, the broad that's world. right. The universe at large is cold. That's why we need to be close to the furnace right. in the habitable zone, yes. not too far from the host right. star, right. but not too close because otherwise we would uh, basically boil There'd be no ocean, they'd be boiled. Bo exactly. Boiled, right. um, and so um, it turns out that in our vicinity there are many low mass stars, much lower than the sun. The nearest star is Proxima, and just uh, recently it was found to have a planet uh, orbiting around it um, in the habitable zone called and, Proxima and if, B. And if it's a small, uh, small mass star, the habitable zone will obviously be closer. 20 times closer than the Earth is right. from the and Sun. Right, so the, 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 uh, circular, the um, orbit will be much shorter. It's about 11.2 days. So very short. So if there are humans out there, they <laughs> celebrate a birthday every 11 days. It's a very pleasant <laughs> place. I'm actually trying to convince uh, my wealthy friends to invest in real estate on that planet <laughs> because the value will only go up in the future. Yeah. Uh, our civilization would like, at some point, would have to move away from the solar system yeah. because in the very long term, uh, seven billion years from now, the sun will die. But even before that, there is a uh, risk uh, from uh, impact of asteroids that kill the dinosaurs, yeah. for example. Uh, there is a risk from bad politics. Um, <laughs> the climate may change. Right. And so we, at some distant point in the future, might want to move away from Earth. Now, uh, we actually did a calculation where we asked where is and when is life most likely to exist? And we concluded that it's most likely to exist around low mass stars like Proxima Centauri in the very distant future, trillions of years from now, simply because there is much more time, time. Yeah. for it to develop and... and so that, that uh, immediately triggers the obvious question that we are less uh, mediocre than we might have thought, because if we were truly mediocre, and ordinary and, and not central, we would be, you know, five trillion years from now around the low mass star celebrating our birthday every 11 days. Right, we might be premature for life in the universe, or there might be hazards around low mass stars that we are oh. not aware of. For example, since the planets are closer to their host star to keep themselves uh, warm, yeah. um, they're exposed to a much stronger stellar wind oh. that could strip off the atmosphere also, they are uh, exposed to very strong ultraviolet li light uh, from the Loma star, especially when it's young. Loma stars spend about a billion years in a phase where they are very active early on. And that could, in principle, uh, sterilize a planet. 
All right, so, but in general, the history of human understanding of the cosmos has made us less and less central uh, in, in terms of our perception. I know this is a, 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 an argument that you've, uh, that you've uh, um, really extended. Yeah, I advocate uh, the principle of cosmic modesty. <laughs> uh, in my view, um, every time we thought that we are special, we uh, ended up being wrong. Uh, humans thought that we're at the center of the universe, that the sun moves around the earth. Then we figured out that we are not at the physical center of the universe. Sure. The earth moves around the sun, the sun moves around the center of the galaxy. The galaxy drifts in some random direction relative to the cosmic rest frame. And so we are clearly not at the center of the physical uh, universe. Still, a lot of scientists believe that we are at the center of the biological universe. However, I apply the principle of modesty uh, <laughs> to this problem. and That's a nicer word than mediocrity. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I believe that we are not special. I mean, when I looked at my daughters when they were young, uh, they thought that the world centers around them. And as they grew up, they matured. So they served as a miniature for human history. <laughs> and so it's quite natural for humans to think that they are at the center, they are special. But my sense is that if we find primitive life and intelligent life on the same planet here on Earth, it must exist out there. And it's only a challenge to find it, but we will find it one day, even if it takes a lot of effort for us to develop sensitive enough instruments. I'm very optimistic that we will find evidence for both primitive and intelligent life. What, what would you estimate the time frame to be? I think for primitive life, it's likely to be decades uh, within my lifetime. Intelligent life, I'm, it's completely uncertain because we don't know uh, how unusual are the conditions necessary for intelligence. We don't fully understand how we came to exist. Some people still doubt that we have intelligence here on Earth. <laughs> um, but uh, my view uh, is that we should search for it at the same time. Uh, the astronomical community is uh, more or less unified in the search for primitive life. That's part of the mainstream. Yeah. But the search for intelligent life is out of the mainstream uh, for no obvious reason to me. I think it's just a sociological uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, in my view, uh, we should look at the sky for signals that might indicate intelligence. I did once a back-of-the-envelope calculation. Um, how visible would a nuclear war be yeah. on another planet? And um, it turns out that even with our best telescopes, um, we cannot really see a nuclear war on the nearest star yeah. <laughs> planet. Um, the one argument that I would, I would give to, to counter that uh, is uh, that uh, human beings have had just barely a few thousand years of recorded history, a few hundred, uh, a few hundred years of, re of real science, and barely a century, maybe a little more than a century, of modern science from, with relativity and quantum mechanics. And in this fraction of an eye blink in, in, in cosmic history, in, in almost 14 billion year history, we've accomplished so much so quickly that to me sounds kind of special. It is uh, special to us, <laughs> obviously, but the question is whether in, in the big perspective of the universe it is special. Um, and uh, uh, in particular, I think we should uh, search in the sky for signals that may originate from technologies as advanced as we have here on Earth. We started by searching for radio communication because that's the first technology that we developed that transmitted signals into space. Uh, those signals are now uh, over a hundred light years away. And if there is anyone out there, we will hear a response at some point. Um, but nowadays we are contemplating the possibility of sending a spacecraft to Proxima B using a laser beam that pushes on a sail. Uh, this project is called Starshot, and I'm chairing the advisory committee for that project. And I started thinking, if we are contemplating such a project, perhaps there is another civilization out there that already mastered this technology for a billion years. How would such a beam of radiation aimed to push a sail look like if it sweeps across the sky? It would look like a burst of radiation. And so do we see bursts that we don't fully understand the origin of? The answer is yes, these are called fast radio bursts. And so we did a calculation where we tried to figure out if those fast radio bursts could originate from beams associated with an advanced civilization that is trying to push 
a sail attached to a very massive spacecraft. And we found that, in principle, it's possible, even if the beam comes from the edge of the universe, all you need is a power that is equivalent to the amount of power intercepted by the Earth from the Sun. You need to collect it with solar cells and then beam it in radio waves. And so we suggested that perhaps fast radio bursts are associated with light sails. Um, you know, there are 10 to the power 20 planets in the observable volume of the universe. That's more than the number of grains of sand, sand that you found on all beaches on Earth. So when I hear about emperors or kings that were extremely proud of themselves in conquering a piece of land here on Earth, it reminds me of an ant that hugs a grain of sand on the background landscape of a huge beach. It's not very impressive. It teaches us modesty. <laughs>